All right, welcome to another episode of <laughs> New Wine Uncorked, and we're here Friday. Uh, February is moving along, you know, and uh, for some, you know, this, uh, the 11th means that uh, we're getting geared up for uh, the celebration of St. Valentine, and he's, uh, you know, the, the I guess, the, the saint um, that's usually attributed to the spread of love. And the reason why we can do that, though, and we've been talking about this for New Wine and Corked, if anyone knows, uh, New Wine and Corked is part of New Wine, New Wine Skins, which is the Institute for Cultural Engagement. And it's out of uh, Portland, and we have um, a living laboratory. And the, the point of New Wine is to follow uh, the biblical script, where it calls us to love the Lord our God, so as to love our neighbor as ourselves. So we start to see theological and biblical uh, playing out of faith. And um, if anyone's done reading, you know, you've, you can read uh, the Danish philosopher who was a theologian and, a, and a, a dude like the rest of us just pining after this God. Who is this God? And his name is Soren Kierkegaard. And what he talked about was faith was this absolute paradox. It's this thing that doesn't make sense because you're, you're expected to go beyond uh, go beyond our thinking, go beyond what reason tells us is possible into the absolute paradox, because faith is something that pulls us into a realm that uh, we can't even imagine until the spirit enlivens us. And then we, uh, whatever we want to call them, our creative powers, our, our imaginative powers come back to life. If you remember as a kid, all the great thoughts that we used to have, you know, and as we get older, we start to then just uh, chalk those thoughts up as fantastical or all well, those are childish, imaginative thoughts. And yet I think God continues to draw us back into that creativity and imagination and says, hey, the impossible possibility, you know, with God, all things are possible. And so as we continue to step into this God who is love, we want to continue to uh, ask and, and, and really reflect on our lives as well as the communal life of the church. What does this mean? You know, so if God is love and we are called to love as God or become love, how does this uh, play out in my life? You know, in 2022, amidst uh, COVID ups and downs, mask mandates, no mandates, you know, the releasing of, of culture back into normalcy, um, let alone all the other typical societal things that we get to deal with, the discriminations and prejudices and financial ups and downs. And so as a Christian on today's world stage, sometimes it feels like I'm entering into chaos. And so our goal for uh, New Line Cork is to step into that and to step into the chaos so as to uncork the truth of what it means to live as a follower of Christ. And so we're stoked that you're joining us today. Um, today we're live on uh, YouTube and we can see it. You can see it possibly as a move. You know, we're going back and forth. We use uh, both social media platforms, YouTube, as well as Facebook. So thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, you can place uh, your comments right there to the side in the live chat as well as uh, after this is done, you could go on to our YouTube page and then take the video and share it with friends and family. And so stepping into the dialogue, we've been talking about God is love and what that looks like. And then connecting that to, or hoping to connect it to this idea of God's promises and then fulfilled promises. Um, and we've been talking, the four of us as well, you know, what does it look like? So when we say God is love, how does that play out in my life, you know, as a Christian? And then what confidence do I have? You know, what confidence do I have when we say that this God is the God of promises? You know, what does he promise? And why does it matter for me in 2022? Especially when I read the Old Testament, even the New Testament, 2000 years ago seems like a awful long time. You know, when we talk about the history of the United States and we're talking, you know, 200, 300 years here, we're talking 2000 years just for the birth of Christ. So in our daily work, what are some of the things that we confront, though, uh, or come into uh, contact with that that obscures the reality, the truth that God is love that we encounter and some of the ways in which we encounter it? How do we embrace these uh, uh, hindrances for the playing out? Uh, that truth in my life that God is love, or what are some of the hindrances that we see right now in the church uh, today that's kind of, you know, uh, clouding the message that 
No, this church is founded on a God who is love and who wants to engage where we're at. So definitely with your with the question, um, I think any demonstration of love that we see on the earth is a demonstration of God acting out or working with humanity. Um, whether it be a believer or non-believer, whether it be through the church or through a pagan or through <laughs> anything of the sort, anytime you see any authentic, any just any expression of love um, within the world, that's God interacting with the world, whether or not the person realizes it. So in the things that I think hinder it, one of the things I think that hinders it, um, we've talked about it over the past couple of weeks, is just um, the fact our self-love, our opinion of ourselves ourselves not seeing ourselves as lovable become something that can hinder the ability to be lovable, be to love others, to be relational, all those kind of things, because we see ourselves as ones that aren't loved by God. But when we embrace that love that God has given us and allow that love to flow through us, we show that generosity, we show that love that's overflowing in our lives, and particularly in the church. So the church should be, you know, the, the kind of the leaders in that regard, and in many regards we are. Um, and just how we serve people, how we reach the least of these, whether it's not happening, you know, in a mainstream level, or we don't see it all the time, where we get confused with what kind of the loudest voices are. Still in all, Christians are very much leading the charge and being out here with people and demonstrating God's love to people because they're loved by Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's a confidence too. Oh yeah, Jim. And I was just going to say, you know, I mean, Phil brings up a good point is that um, I think sometimes we think that God's love only flows through followers of Jesus. But the reality is, is that God's love is in everybody. And um, mm. and so like when our house, you know, our, a few years back, our house, you know, burnt down, um, there was a lot of generous people. And, you know, and we saw the love of God through the general, I mean, I, and for me, well, we saw the love of God through the generosity of people. And so, and my feeling is, is that, you know, we love, people love being generous. I mean, there's something, there's something about being generous. And I just, I think when, when we can be generous or even express God's love, um, that's when we reflect the image of God, right? And so I think it's important to realize, you know what, God's, you know, God's love is reflected through everybody. Well, you know, it doesn't, the Christian faith does not have is not cornered the market of God's love, right? But I think at the same time, I think what the obstacle of and the sad part is, is when followers of Jesus do not reflect that love. I mean, that's yeah. and the only and the and the obstacle to that is that they don't take God seriously. They don't take His word seriously. They don't they don't take seriously that, you know, like like um, Steve or um, Phil alluded to, um, you know, we don't take seriously that God loves us, right? We don't take seriously that we are to love our neighbors, or, you know, love our enemies, pray for those who persecute us. And so I think, you know, that's the opposite. The obstacle is that as followers, we don't take God's word seriously when it comes to love. Yeah, I would say the same thing. I mean, uh, I think it comes down to the brokenness of sin, um, whether that's, you know, us not loving ourselves correctly or not loving the other correctly. And when we fall into that, whether it's, you know, the inward, uh, we're just looking at ourselves, and we can't even love ourselves, and our focus is self. Um, but we can't even see ourselves as, as God sees us. Um, or we're walking around with like this bitterness and resentment and just judgment and criticism towards others, rather than that outpouring of love for the other. And, um, that tarnishes the image of God as well, because we're not seeing the face of God in others. And so then how can we, if we, if we are not acknowledging that the person in front of me is made in the image of the same God that I'm made in, um, how can we, how can we begin to love them? If we can't look in the mirror and appreciate, um, his creation and his intentionality in creating each one of us, how can we you know, begin to love the other. Uh, so those are definitely some hindrances, uh, some obstacles in our everyday life. But I do think that, you know, you look around and even just the sun shining and um, the colors of the sunrise, the sunset, the just the detail in every single part of nature or in another person, 
um, we can see that and see how much God loves each and every one of us and how much he loves um, every part of his creation. Uh, and so, you know, when we see that much intentionality and detail, uh, I don't know, for me, like this has been, I'm, I'm like 22 weeks, um, pregnant and, and every single week I am able to learn something new about my baby that's growing inside of me and every single detail. I'm like, that's, that is a God of love. Um, (laughs) you know, like every single movement and kick, I feel I'm like, yeah, I, I love this baby. And that's a reflection of God's love for me. Um, because we are his children. And so if I, as like this sinful, broken person can love this baby so fully, imagine how much more this, this God of unconditional sinless perfection and love can love us. It's Mm. it's mind blowing. You know, Kaylee, uh, you know, what you brought up too, is just that um, it's that mind shift, right? About we can be loved. And I was just thinking, you know, I think, you know, it's appropriate that we call this uncorked because it's kind of letting the genie out of the bottle. And sometimes once you let the genie out of the bottle, you can't get him back in. And so the conversation just keeps going. But, you know, you know, I think about like the woman at the well. Right. And so here she comes and, you know, she, Jesus says, go back, get your husband, come back. And she says, I don't have a husband. Right. And then Jesus kind of shares the story. I mean, really, he kind of says, you know, well, of course you don't. You, you, you had five husbands. And, you know, we don't even really know if they, they died or if they, you know, divorced her. But, he, you know, he tells, he tells the lady the story or he tells the woman at the well, kind of basically Jesus is saying, I know your story, right? And as soon as he's done sharing her story, she like changes the subject. Oh, you must be a prophet. Almost like it, it's so painful for her to recite the story. But the interesting thing is that Jesus doesn't follow up on the story. Jesus doesn't say, well, wait a minute, let's go back to the story. <laughs> let's go back to the five husbands. Let's let's focus on your sin. Let's, let's focus on the darkness of your life. But I think Jesus, he, um, he brings up the story, not to judge her, but he brings up the story to say, you know, you are seen, you are heard. I know you. And he still, you know, he still continues to share with her hope. He, he still invites her to be part of this bigger, bigger community. That's, that doesn't separate Samaritans and Jews, but Jesus is inviting her. And then her story, her testimony really brings the villagers, right? And finally, they say, okay, it's not your story anymore, but we're here because we've heard and we believe he's a savior. But I think, you know, that Jesus does know our stories. And I think that woman at the well is an example of, you know what, Jesus really doesn't get hung up on your story. So you shouldn't get hung up on your stories either. And, you know, it's kind of, let's just press on to love. Let's, let's press on to the, you know, I want you to know how much I love you. I want it. I want you to know that, that although we've been living separate lives or you know, you've been looked at as kind of the crazy, wacky, you know, cousins. I want to bring everybody together. I want, you know, let's just let's just get this together. So, and I think in connection to that, Jim is our story connects to his story. I mean, one of the things that I love to that I love to do is whenever you take um, we take communion and we all break the bread together and the like. Um, we have those kind of settings. I love just kind of watching people come from across the room to grab their portion of the bread. And I just think like, yo, Jesus met us at so many different places, so many different places across the world. And we all found that oneness in him. And whether or not we live it out at one time or another, it still just amazes me of where God finds us at the different places in our lives, different stories, and we all meet him and he's the one that completes our story. He's the one that allows us and fills us and gifts us and all those kind of things that allows us to be one church. So, yeah. Yeah, it's cool too, because uh, with that story with the, I mean, uh, I wrote this article on um, because we get caught up in, in theology, we get caught up in narrative theology or uh, uh, systematic theology, categorizing stuff. And, and I was trying to point out that, you know, if you look at his story, which is history, we are drawn into his story so as to then be given really our story. Because a couple of weeks ago, when we were talking about um, why things are the way they are, uh, Phil made the point of so often we forget to account for sin. 
So when we start talking about the picture in front of us, if we don't account for that, then we don't account for why things could be a bit off. And so when we're drawn into his story, then our history becomes ours. It becomes a story of the people. Well, who are those people? Like you were saying, Jim, it's not about Jew or Gentile. It's not about female or male. And that's not to then um, uh, metamorphosize the human into a blob of unknowingness, right? Where when, when we say the distinction between Jew and Gentile, we're not saying the distinction of person, whereas then you, because that's uh, unfortunately what happens with like uh, the Buddhist philosophy and with Nirvana and where you you kind of fade into nothingness, you know, where you lose your distinction, whereas Christianity, the opposite happens. When we go to the well, it's meant to be this like lessening and in exam exactly what Jesus did though. Everyone at that part of the well could look out, right? It's in the center. And so they could look out and they know who doesn't go during the heat of the day. And Jesus has the audacity to do it in public. And what normally would have been done in public though, would have been a public chastising. What he does is he fully embraces this woman knowing that there are onlookers, you know, and like you were saying, Jim, so often our human, at least my um, human tendency is, is when I catch someone in their wrong, and I know that in this situation, I, I am the one pointing it out, I tend to hammer that, you know, we have all these wonderful, you know, beautiful sayings, oh, don't beat the dead horse, you know, and all these kind of things, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because why? We continue to go back to this source of usually negative darkness of where this person is less, you know, oh, it's helping myself look better by blowing out your candle or whatever those kind of things, right? It comes back to where Jesus focuses on her and who she is, the beautiful truth of her we and our humanness tend to focus on the negative, the dark side, so as to then elevate me to say, well, I'm a little bit better than you, just so you know that. Um, but Jesus, he says, look, you are better than what you think you are. And in fact, you define yourself by these things. What I see is a creature meant for love, you know? And so I think that's where the audacity of that love is, where like, as Phil, you were saying, you know, in the one of the theologians I was reading, Hans uh, Urs von Baltzar, within, and he's a Catholic theologian, they talk about the anonymous Christian, the one who is acting out Christianity without knowing it themselves, that sometimes the non-Christians, the people who have not said yes to Jesus as their savior, tend to act more Christian than those who have proclaimed uh, a faith in word. And so I think we need to leave space for that, that it should wreck us when he goes to talk to the woman at the well, we should put in our minds, every person that we think is despicable, sinful, that there's no way they're sitting next to me in church, there's no way, you know, and go, huh, Jesus actually goes to the well to embrace, am I willing to do that and not see their sin, but see the one sitting in front of me, just like Jesus doesn't see my sin because why on the cross he annihilates sin and yet we tend to live on this side of easter still with the focus of sin instead our focus needs to be savior you know and then you you, you know the other piece too you bring up is you know just about the well i mean that that was like a common place was well, i mean right i mean they shared it it wasn't i mean you know, Jesus picks this place of commonality, this place to where instead of saying, hey, we're better than you and blah, blah. I mean, they kind of get into that conversation a little bit. But here's, I mean, the Jacob's well, everybody had the, the ancestral tie was there. I mean, it could even be said, hey, did you hear the one about Jesus, the Samaritan and the Muslim? Because, you know, there's that ancestral <laughs> tie, but there's that commonality. And I think sometimes that's maybe that's an obstacle about love is that we don't see the commonality. We don't begin with a place of commonality to start the conversation or to engage people. Hey, Matt, I, I want to disagree with you on something that you mentioned. Our way, yeah. A little bit. Um, the notion that God sees us, and he sees us as lovable, yes, but he sees us as lovable with the sin, with mm. brokenness. And I think and I think that kind of connects to what Jim was just mentioning a moment ago is that one of the things that's common about all of humanity is that we're all broken. And when, no sin is greater than the other. We all have our things that 
that have kept us from living a godly life, has kept us from seeing God's love, has kept us from seeing not seeing the other person as in the image of God. We all have those things. And so sometimes just identifying those things and saying, hey, I, I, I get that is, is a way that kind of can bring us close together. Now, when we harp on those things and don't see the lovability in the other person, then of course that becomes a major hindrance. But the sin is still there. The sin is still there. So I don't want to go too far the other direction where we overlook yeah i I mean i hear what you're saying i totally but there's still need i think we need to live in the tension because i sometimes and i want to i know this is against people are gonna be like oh my gosh you're you can't push against martin luther the great theologian when he says simultaneously sinner and saint i don't know because what happens i then this is what i ask my students all the time what happens on the cross so if jesus swallow sin he becomes sin then does the father what how can the father see sin in us if jesus takes all sin and i'm not saying that we don't live out our sin nature because i think we're more prone to what we knew before knowing jesus so we tend to follow those habits you know and so it's like more like breaking a habit but i don't want to say that i'm controlled by sin because i want to live on this side of the cross. So I hear what you're saying, Phil, like we still have the sin to account for. Absolutely. But I want to press into the tension. And I know this makes some people uh, real, real nervous of saying that, gosh, I think if I lived through the Holy Spirit's leading to me fully 100% today, whether or not that can happen, I don't know with the connection between free will and predestination, but couldn't I live today, this day, if I was fully living through the spirit, like Jesus did, apart from sin could i go one day and not sin if i was truly living according to the spirit because of what was done on the cross i'm not saying that um it 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 could have it might happen i'm saying do we allow for the possibility because i i agree with you we still need to account for sin but i think in today's culture we account so much for sin that we still see ourselves as a sinner and i'm not sure that's what the father sees if what happened on the cross is what we say, he died for sin once for all, you know? So when we take communion, like you were saying, the beautiful truth of communion is as we're all walking up there, shouldn't there be a sense of brokenness walks up and mended walks back, you know, and how we live that out. And I agree with you, Phil, we still need to understand and and don't, I don't want to wash away and say, Oh, but Jesus died for sin. So forget sin. Everything's glory. And yet I don't want sin to be the thing that hinders me from living out the love that we've been talking about. So there's this weird tension. So I agree with you and yet sort of want to push back against the simultaneously sinner and saint, because I feel like when we say I'm sinner, we define ourselves by I am sin as opposed to saying I am the beloved who gets caught up in sin kind of thing. I think that's the part. And I'll let you go, Kayla, after this. Um, But the the tension that you that you mentioned a couple of times i think that's the tension is that we don't go up as sinner to receive communion and come back as redeemed we go up as sinner and redeemed person and comes back sinner and redeemed person and living in both those spaces and that's i think that's the tension because i think we we do end up feeling one way or the other either i'm unlovable or i'm fully loved by god there, there's a guy i know right now that he has a problem with alcohol and and he will never call himself an alcoholic because he's a sinner saved by grace. He's a child of God. So, but if, if you leave him alone near a bar for, for any length of time, um, you'll demonstrate he's an alcoholic. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a trip. <laughs> but living in both those places, and one thing we talk about in New Wine all the time is that both and, and wrestling with the tension as you brought up, and living in both those worlds and knowing that Christ has redeemed us, so we lean into that, but we know the reality of who we are as believers. Yeah, I, w- I mean, I would say, like, uh, when we are when we talk about, when you say the sin, like, can bring people together, um, I think that happens, or at least this is what I've witnessed, um, it's mostly in, in settings like Bible studies or home groups, and um, are you christian (laughs) yeah yeah oh you know good christian settings um where we come together and you know we're actually like honest with each other um and we're like hey here's how messed up i am um but it's it's typically like we're actually able to 
be authentic and say, this is who I was uh, before Jesus. And I need you to hold me accountable so that I don't fall back into that. Um, so that's, that's where the tension is, right? Like we need, and I think this is part of the, the, the need um, for community helps us see further God's love and experience further God's love. But because we live in this tension of, I am redeemed, I am the beloved and I am God's child and, and that's my identity, but I live with the consequences of sin. I live with you know, that temptation that I'm going to fall into. Um, but I don't, I think that he wouldn't command us to be perfect if that wasn't a possibility. I don't think that he would set us up to fail. So I think that, yeah, uh, if I really, really wanted to, I think that's the key is if, if we really wanted to, and if we spent the whole day, I, every second, like intentionally and developed in the spirit. I am not sinning today. I'm not sinning in any way. I think that it's possible. I think we should entertain that possibility more because I don't think that he would command us or set us up to fail. Um, cause that's not loving. You don't like, that's not, you don't do that to your kid as a parent. You're not going to be like, okay, you, you go, I'll just sit here and watch you fall. Like it's, you know, and not comfort you afterwards. So, um, I think that there's a lot of that paradox in both statements where he's not going to set us up to fail and it is possible for us to not sin. However, it's almost too easy for us to give into our sinful nature and there are going to be consequences of our, our actions. Like I, I get to experience the miracle and the beauty of pregnancy and being a parent, but I also have to experience the pain of childbirth because that's a consequence of sin. So there are like, I don't know. I don't know. But I also think that it comes back to, we need each other to hold each other accountable to say, Hey, I want to live as perfection, as redeemed, as saint. And I can't do that alone. I need you to help me Um, to hold me accountable as my brother and sister in Christ to say, yeah, that was your past, but you are redeemed. And, you know, we, I don't think that we lean into that enough either. You know, I just think of the, um, the whole idea of be holy as I am holy. Right. I mean, there's, there's this, I mean, there's not like, Hey, just do, do, just do the best you can get really close to being holy, but it's like, be holy as I am holy. And I think that, you know, and, and I was just thinking, and I know that um, stories break down or analogies break down, but you know, I mean, it's kind of like if you're in a race and you fall down, you, get, you know, you trip, I mean, you're expected to win, but you trip and then, you know, somebody comes back to you and goes, hey, um, don't feel bad. It was bound to happen, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, no, it wasn't bound to happen. I tripped, you know what I mean? And, and so would you rather just have somebody come, you know, either say, wow, it was bound to happen. Wait, you know, I guess that's, that's it, you know. Or do you want somebody to say, you know, get up, you know, do you know why you tripped? You tripped because of this. If you would have done this, you know, and like in basketball games, you know, I see people shooting and this is like the professional level. So I have no idea. I'm only guessing, but I get frustrated when they keep shooting threes. I mean, you know, even if somebody's hot and somebody's good and they keep shooting threes, I get frustrated, but you know what, in their heart and in their mind, they think I can do this. I can make this happen. And I, and I think, you know, maybe that's the attitude as far as what does it mean to be holy? It's like, I can do this. Um, but when we don't do it, <laughs> you know, don't get frustrated, don't get angry at ourselves, but to realize, okay, um, okay, I got it, get back at it. You know, it's like it, it, the Olympics and skating, you know, the person doesn't, what's her name? She fell and, and she like sat there for like, <laughs> I was like thinking, get out of the track already, you know, <laughs> grow up, what's wrong with you? You know, I'm like the most incompassionate person, but you know what? I mean, she was like racing in, I don't know, the super G or whatever the, you know, whatever it was yesterday but i mean there's kind of this getting back up and just getting at it again you know and so i think this this idea about be holy as i am holy you know phil you talked about your buddy you know i mean you know we know of people that just kind of like go into their temptation right i mean it's like you know i'm saved by grace or that becomes the ticket to do anything you know anything is okay but there's just something about be holy as i am holy says you know what let's do this let's get this done and And not remind us that, oh, yeah, when you fall, you know. Mm. 
I want to, yeah. you know, I, I want to, can I say something really quick? And hopefully this doesn't change the trajectory, but I've got a question for Kayla. Here we go. <laughs> you talk about, you talk about um, your pregnancy and the baby that you're carrying, that you're, you know, you just, you're just loving this individual, you're taking care of this individual. What is it? What is it about this individual that you have no idea about, never met, don't know if they're going to be good or bad, you know, what? but what is it about that, the child growing inside that says, you know, I love this child, um, that, that allows you to say, you know what, I'm even going to, my wife had, what do they call it, the diabetes when you're pregnant. I mean, she was really good about just eating the right things and just taking care of herself. But what is it about not knowing this person, but your willingness to step out in faith and just love? love this unknown right somebody you don't know that's a that's a good question my dad and I were actually talking about this the other week um and uh I I don't I don't know other than like I it gives me a glimpse of of God's love like to understand a little bit better God's love for us and his selflessness and the sacrificial love that he has for us because I don't know I, I don't know if this this kid will grow up and absolutely just rebuke me and be like, I want nothing to do with you. Um, and I hope that doesn't happen. Right. Like, but I, there's no certainty in, in what, how this child is going to feel about me. And yet that doesn't change how I feel about them. I, I, I don't really understand it. And that's why I think the only explanation is, yeah, this is, I guess this is what a little taste of what God's love is. Cause we run away from him all the time. We turn away and we're like, yeah, I'm not good. Um, I don't, I don't want to be near you right now. Um, and I, I, as a child have done that to my parents too, where I'm like, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to talk to you right now. Um, and that's, you know, hurtful. Uh, and that's not loving. And so like, as a parent who, I don't know, I don't know this kid. I, I've never, you know, and I don't know who they'll grow up to be. Um, so it's a really, it's, it's really fascinating. It's really interesting to me. Uh, but I think that it is, yeah, it's like an instinctual to, for me to want to like take care of myself in order to take care of this child that like, why wouldn't I, um, why wouldn't I love them in every way that I can? Why wouldn't I protect them, um, in every way that I can? That's like, I don't know. I, it just is how it is. But when you sit there and you think about it, I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> and, and I don't know. I hope that they'll love me back, but it's, you know, I sometimes I feel like that's how God is with us where he's like, I, I just love them so much. And I hope that they'll love me back. I'll, I hope they'll see that and they'll love me back. That wasn't really an answer. <laughs> no, it was. no, no, it was a great answer. And I think, you know, even in your, you know, you had made a comment. I thought, oh, that's a good example. You know, when you said, I love, I love this child and I'm willing to take care of myself. And that, you know, that gets back to love your neighbors as yourself. I mean, it's kind of like you love yourself and then you loving yourself and taking care of yourself. You're taking care of the other. Isn't that the we, the thing with love, though, is that sometimes I feel like if you can explain it, then maybe it's not love. It's more duty in the sense of like love should cause us to do some things that when we stop and pause and go, wait, why did I do it? The people looking in going, it doesn't make sense. And you're like, I know it doesn't because love and this is the weird. I think that, again, this is the tension. Sin is illogical. You know, it doesn't make sense. Uh, in 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 the heavenly realm right but in the earthly realm love doesn't make sense you know sin makes sense here in this kingdom on earth and love doesn't but in heaven love does make sense and sin is not even a part of the conversation so i think and so that's where when we talk about a lot of theologians will talk about oh jesus comes with this upside down kingdom even metzger talks about that and i'm like no no 
the upside down kingdom is because of us. It was created right side up. What happened is, is we decided to pull the lever from the tree, you know, and as we pulled down on that uh, fruit, everything flipped around, you know? So when we stepped outside of the garden, all of a sudden what used to be upright now was upside down. We just didn't notice it because our first step outside of the garden was due to our own, you know, uh, sinful, whatever choices. And so I think, that when we talk about love, like what Kayla's talking about, I feel like the more that you can define it, the more you're probably doing something out of duty, which doesn't mean that it's wrong, but we have to question ourselves because if we're doing something such as going in, helping fill out at the uh, homeless shelter, you know, or going with you, Jim, and take with the church and going in and, and, and ministering to uh, people in, in the congregation. But if we're doing it because I have to, I'm obedient, uh, it's duty, it's going to fade. And Jim, you always point this out that if we're, we're, you know, acting because of, of, of a, an issue or an idea, it's going to fade. Movements are based on people, right? Our, our affinity towards people, uh, uh, our need to be with the people in front of us, not because of an idea or uh, a cause, but because of the people. And so that's the difference with love. I think love, when you step into love, you know, and this is what uh, I think I said it before with the the um, the lyric that in running Little Wayne has. I can't tell you, but I can show you. Like I can't tell you so often what love is. Like when I'm loving my kids, we're watching this show called uh, I think it's called Mi uh, Mosquito Coast. And there's this one scene where one of the dads, you know, they're in trouble, and the dad says to the son or to the kids, "What we're gonna do right now?" Some people would look on and say, "This is not good parenting." you know, but they're doing it for their survival. And I think a lot of times when we do love things, those around us, even people who call themselves Christians are going to a lot of times say that is just not good, whatever. That's not good parenting. That's not good loving. And yet look at Jesus. Someone would say he went to the well. He did not remind her that she was a sinner. You know, he didn't, she left there thinking that she was okay, you know, and some, and us Christians want us to be, make sure that she walks away with her head down going, Oh my gosh, I'm just, you know, and yet Jesus elevates her and says no. And I think that's that love where in some sense, it can't make sense because it's so overwhelming where it should kind of wreck our brains to where we start to look at that sinner saint kind of thing and go, oh, that is a tension that I live in. You know, how do I see myself kind of thing? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I like, um, you know, maybe that's how, you know, better to describe or to describe love. It's really, it, it really is about how you feel, right? I mean, it's, it's just that, you know, there's something about fulfilling what you're supposed to be doing. Um, there's something that makes your, you know, makes inside leap. I mean, there's something that, and, you know, granted, there's days where it's like, no, don't want to do this, you know, and I'm sure, you know, and I think about Phil, I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know if you press Phil to say, why are you doing what you're doing? I mean, he just, I mean, look at the smile on his face, you know I mean? And some people are just like, no, that's, that's crazy nuts, you know, because you're just working with people that are just constantly failing, but there's something, I don't know. There's something beyond that. And probably too, it's probably tough sometimes though. Right. I mean, I know like when uh, leading a church, you know, same thing with you, Jim, sometimes going in and knowing that you're going to minister to people who might not appreciate it it's taxing you know i'm sure phil like some of the dudes that come back you're like holy crap bro <laughs> we talked about this we even put a plan together and then they're coming back to you and you're going through the same stuff and yet i would i don't know i mean you're a way better man than i am phil so i'm not going to say what you're you're thinking but sometimes when i was you know pastoring at the church i there was part of me that was judging them like how many times and then yet Jesus would just sting me or the spirit would sting me and say seven times seven, man, like, you know, like 70. So I don't know, Phil, like, I agree, like with Jim, like, why, like, why do you do it? Like, why do we, right? Wow. Big question. Um, it's for the big bucks, isn't it, Phil? Oh, I know wow. it's, it's all like, about the, it's about the helicopter all and about the shiny the new car. <laughs> Yeah. The helicopter. The money. He's all about the money. <laughs> I'm all about, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Um, that's why he's got the new beanie on. That's it, right? I was, yeah, that looks like the fancy one. I couldn't afford that one. I had to go get the <laughs> one that was made out of a paper bag. 
for me, the biggest thing that that makes it for me to come back to do the work that I do, whether it be this work or pastoring, is because I know I mess up all the time too. Um, and that's the thing. And when I talk to the guys, I do not talk to them from a standard of, hey, man, uh, it's more like, hey, you want to be better. And I'm just wanting to walk alongside of you to be better. And then even if you backslide, even if something happens, let's fall back into this relationship. Let's fall back into what do you know about God? What do you know to be true? And then, and this is the same process when I fall and when I slip up, when I do things, I'm not a parent the way I should be. I'm not a husband the way I should be. Son, brother, those kind of things. I just kind of, I try to fall back into what do I know about God? I try to rest back into, I know God loves me. I know God's gifted me and move forward in that regard. Um, and that's not always the easiest thing. And even with the guys I work with, I understand it's not the easiest thing. That's why I push them and challenge them towards. But I know it's a challenging thing sometimes, especially when you look at yourself and you see someone and you just see, I'm going to mess this up again. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, this is going to be the first time you're not going to mess it up. And they're like, no, it's going to mess up. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's, let's ride it out and see. Let's work the plan and see what happens. So, yeah. But, you know, that brings up a good argument or good point about what you and um, – you guys are just are uh, you and Matt were talking about is <laughs> because you know I mean isn't it that you know Phil even though you say I mess up I mean we need to be vulnerable but also at the same time people need to see people that were where God's love works I mean we you know to be able to kind of do it and people like you know and I mean sure we have our vulnerable times we have you know uh, you know times in our life but I mean you are salt and light. We're called to be salt and light. And I so, so I know because I know you that you are salt and light. So when people look at you, you know, they look and they don't go, well, at least I have a chance in my life because Phil screws up. You know, they don't, I mean, their, their thing is like, you know what, I want to, I want to have that same power. I want to have that same strength. I, you know, and, and so I think there is, you know, there is this application where people want to look and see, oh, it can be done. Right. I mean, it it, it can be done. But also there's this vulnerability where it's like, you know what, I know, you know, um, I know your struggles, you know, it's it, it, my struggle is not alcohol, but my struggle is this, you know, but I think that that's and that's the challenge. You know, I think that's the balance of we need to stand to salt and light. We need to give people hope that, you know what, to live this life, it works. <laughs> you know, I mean, it works, but also at the same time to say, you know what, I've had to get up and dust myself off. And so mm. I think. So, I, you know, I'm, I mean, I think that's, you know, so when you said, Phil, um, oh, yeah, I, I, you know, I mess up too. That's why I'm here. No, you're salt and light. <laughs> you know, I mean, and I know, you know, we know our vulnerable parts. And that's the important part is that we aren't like some of these super, you know, these televangelists who, do, do, you know, they don't look like they have because people, what kind of hope is that, right? I mean, it's like, well, I tried that, but I'm not getting the money. I don't have you know, whatever, you know, my life is still a struggle. Um, the reality is, is that, you know, it's not to get us around the struggle, but it's to take us through the struggle. And one other thing with that is, is knowing my story as well. I mean, I grew up Northeast Portland in the nineties when there was gang violence and I mean, multiple crack houses on this. I live in the same neighborhood I grew up in and yeah, those houses look very different than they did back in the nineties. But, um, but I know my story and I know that, that, you know, the Lord let me get out of this neighborhood in the way that I got out of this neighborhood. There's all sorts of ways I could have left. I, I know people who've committed murders. I, a friend of mine was found a, a, under a bridge in the Columbia a couple of years ago. Like, you know, it's like, I understand what my story could have been. And I have a neighbor, that same thing. We grew up together and same kind of thing. We, we were both, both of us grew up together, both of us grew up with our fathers, and now we have kids, <laughs> and our kids are teenagers in high school, and we're just like, how did this happen? We are the <laughs> exception to the rule, <laughs> you know? If this is the norm, we're the exception, but then that becomes part of the story, is that your life, even everything around you says one particular thing, your life can be something different, yeah. and the Lord is the one that helps you allow this life to be something different, so that's part of part of what I share as well, because that's a part of the realness of the story. So, yeah. And don't you think that comes from, I mean, part of it too, is your willingness to see yourself in those who haven't made it out. You know, I am reminded of, I think it was DL Moody who, when they were asking him why he was feeding, you know, the, the folks bread on the street and the, the beggar on the street. And he said there, but by the grace of God, go I, you know? And so I think Phil, you're bringing up a great point. It's, 
it's not just your love for Christ that compels you to serve those in front of you, but it's your love for Christ that compels you to see in them what Jesus sees in you, right? Because you don't discount these dudes when they come to you. You actually elevate and help them. I mean, every day you're, it seems like you're living the woman at the well, right? You're living where you go to the well, you were playing Jesus and these dudes are coming to you and you're reminding them, no, don't go back and live in that adulterous relationship, but here step into this newness of life. This is what the idea of new wine is, right? Pouring, you take the old, you don't discard it in the sense of completely forget it. You have that reminder though that this new skin these new skins that you're pouring the wine into are able to stretch and grow you because of where you've been you know it's like our past doesn't need to be completely forgotten because that's who we are and so to be reminded um as you were saying phil every day that that could be me you know uh i i mean i think we all have that story of of golly look at my how great is it regardless of what, you know, and I think when we start looking at each other though, that starts to become the problem where we compare ourselves, you know, like if you say to me, Phil, oh, well, your, your background story isn't what mine is. So it's invalid, you know, or I say to you, Phil, you know, yeah, but see what you went through and what I went through is similar, but what Jim went through, that's just nothing compared to what, you know, and so there's this philosopher, uh, Martin Heidegger, who says we have calculative thinking and meditative thinking. And once we get into the calculative where we start comparing things, that's what C.S. Lewis was talking about in Screw Tape Letters. Look at, get the, the, the Christians looking at each other. So they start comparing each other, you know, and start, that's where the sin will start to manifest itself. So it's when you're talking about that, Philly, it's much more of the introspection, right? When you're talking to your friend, you're like, you're, you're looking at yourselves and saying, hey, here we are, look at my life and thankfulness so as to then move out to the one in front of you, right? Like, and it's a both and, it's individual and communal. Absolutely, absolutely. And 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 really when I was pastoring is when this really kind of came about in me, when I had to talk about this regularly, when I had to preach. And yeah, a lot of introspection, just saying, okay, here's where I am, here's where my story, and am I here because I was lucky? Am I here because I worked harder? And looking around like, no, nah, I didn't. I don't think I did anything different than anyone else. I just kind of handled my business as it was in front of me. And the Lord opened up the doors that I, that he ended up leading me into, which led me to where I am. And I mean, it's not the greatest thing in the world all the time, but, <laughs> but at the same token, it's where God has me. And it could have been so different. I think that's what me and my neighbor were talking about. Um, it was a couple of years ago when I moved back in the neighborhood, we knew our lives could be just so different. And we like, it's the grace of God that has us here. So if I know the grace of God is at work in my life, I can see it at work in other people, but I also see the same thing. Every time I see someone on the corner with a sign asking for money, I think if I miss two paychecks, I'll be right beside them. <laughs> you know, maybe one I can, maybe one I can figure out, but if I miss two, I'll be right there beside them. <laughs> so Kayla, I was thinking when, um, when Phil was just talking about, you know, his neighborhood and how he was going to come out. So I was thinking about you. Well, I was thinking about the Mandalorian, right? Because he would say, I can either take you warm or I can take you cold. So how are you going to leave? <laughs> so, um, but I, so I have a question for you. It just dawned on me because, you know, um, you know, we talk about God's love and it's easy to kind of put it on, right? I mean, it's easy to kind of show up and, you know, demonstrate it. We talked about like, you know, I think a few weeks ago, just about, you know, as kids, right? I mean, as, as my grandchild, my grandkids, I mean, they hold it together until mom and dad get home and then all of a sudden it unravels, right? And, and we were able to love. So my question for you is this. I think it's a great testimony that you're sitting here with your dad. And that, you know, I mean, I know that there's a lot of church, you know, I've been in youth ministry for years and years and years, and there's a lot of kids that go into, you know, that, that grow up in the church, loving parents, loving, loving parents. And as soon as they get to college, it's like hasta la vista, baby. And, you know, you're just like, what the heck? And so what is it? I mean, because I think it is about God's love, but it's kind of like being, I mean, it's about experiencing God's love. Not that your dad would probably just, you know, lose it and unravel, but I mean, you know, what is it that you saw kind of, you know, they talk about character and integrity being who you are when people aren't looking. I mean, so what is it about mom and dad's life that, you know, you think, you know what, 
this stuff is real. You know what? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna invest in this. I'm gonna continue be, because at some point you had to make your own decision, right? It's kind of like um, you know, where Ruth says um to Naomi. You know, I mean, she Na- Ruth made a decision to follow Naomi, and I think that you know we I think kids, you know, they're riding on their parents' coattails up until high school, but I think after high school they they finally make a decision, you know, and 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 so I guess you know what is it about God's love, or what was it that you saw about God's love in your family that you know makes you think, you know what, I'm going to stay this. I'm, you know what, I know it's difficult, I know it's hard, but you know what, I'm going to stay the course. Yeah, I I this is what I have told my uh, sister in law too. We've talked about this. Um, the respect that I have for my parents and their faith is like, it's crazy because I had, I had a lot of friends in high school who we all went to, you know, church or their parents went to church and, um, and they were Christian or Christian on Sundays. Um, and you know, but then their house would, you want to name any of them and we'll give them a call. (laughs) Is there people, (laughs) Bill and I can maybe take care of some business. We have a certain set of skills. Yeah. Yeah. No, but their house would be the one to to also host the high school party, you know, because they would rather have their kids uh, drink inside their home and be safe. And that was, you know, their way of like loving as parents, I guess. I don't know. But that that was not my <laughs> that was not my mom and dad. Um, I was not, you know, ever going to have a boyfriend just live with us um, because, you know, that's not that's not what the Bible says, like, that's not okay. You can't, you know, live like you're married before you're married. And, and so just, just the absolute commitment to the truth of who Jesus is. And, you know, this is who this God says he is, and this is the gospel. And these are the things that we live by. Um, and that's hard. And we had conversations, you know, we still have conversations, like, what does that mean? Um, And, and what does that mean for how we live? You know, my dad got to marry me and Chris. And um, before that, you know, like, it was a whole, like, thing of like, hey, but you guys love each other, and you respect each other, but you're not married yet. So you can't, you don't get to act like you're married in, in this way, in this way, in this way, you know, so it's like hard conversations get to happen between parents and and children but there's still the the absolute like yeah but this is who Jesus is and this is who he says he is and this is what he commands of us as followers and there's no wavering on that um you either you either live and you say yes this is who Jesus is and I follow Jesus and that means this is how I'm going to live and that's what that's going to look like or you or you're lukewarm and you're on the fence and you're it's a sheep and the goats thing. Are you going to be a, you know, are you going to be a follower of Jesus or are you going to be lukewarm and, and possibly end up being turned away when you get to heaven? There's no, you, and do you want that possibility? Um, and so, and those are like conversations that have happened in our house. And those, I think are hard conversations to have with your kid, to look at your kid and be like, do you even like want that possibility? Uh, do you, cause I don't want that possibility. I don't want you to end up in hell, but if you're going to say yes to Jesus, then you're saying yes to living like this. And then to have that modeled, um, regardless of situation, regardless of, I don't know, I guess for some parents, it's easier to just accept that their kid has moved in with their boyfriend or girlfriend and they're both adults and that's, you know, what it is. And I would rather have them be a part of my life and love them. Like, but that's not like, you got to hold each other accountable. And if you're going to say, if your kid is going to say, I am a follower of Jesus, then that means that you get to have those hard conversations with them and be like, Hey, you're saying that you are a follower. You're saying that you want to live this faith, but this is not walking in faith. Um, and, and that's what my parents have been able to do because I say yes to Jesus. And so then they get to step in and be like, that's not saying yes to Jesus. That's not what that looks like. And, uh, I, I don't know how many parents actually do that because of fear of losing their kid. I don't know what it is. Um, but that's what I've seen. I've seen a lot of parents not step in and not 
have those hard conversations and not live it out themselves, um, not model the absolute yes to Jesus. Don't you think too, though, um, there's been a weird, as, as you've gotten older, that it's become more of a dialogue, you know, yeah. as the, our parenting's become more of a dialogue to yeah. where the, the, we came to a point where as you were old enough that to go, gosh, we messed up here. Yeah. You know, like to, to, to allow you to see the vulnerability and the authenticity, the transparency, you know, like oh, to yeah. say, Hey, um, because I feel like so often within the Christian world, as we progress in age and maturity, spiritual maturity, yeah. then we become less um, able to be held accountable, right? Like we get older, we're like, whoa, whoa, especially then Jim, I bet you experience this, not that you uh, mean to, but that when people see you as the pastor, they, some pot, I, I mean, I know you're, you're going to say, oh no, we're going to joke about it, but some might actually hold you as if you could in your most holy times, walk on water because you're the pastor, you know, and as a pastor, that's a dude, there's people who they, they wait on every word that you say, that's a lot of power, you know, and so I think that to, as parents, the same thing, you know, you can lord it over your kids um, and say, hey, you're going to do this just because or whatever, or you can enter that dialogue. And I feel like that's the tricky part with yeah. how faith is even well, that's God what, allows us to have that dialogue, right? That's definitely what you guys did, too. There was never like you have to go to church. You have to participate in this. Like it was always our own choice. Um, even growing up, even when you guys had to be at the church, um, and there, it was like, well, are you, are you coming or do you want to be there today? Like we have to be there. So, but it was like, if you want to sit in my office, you can sit in my office. You don't have to be in the service. Um, and there was always that option. And then there was always that dialogue, that communication. And I don't know how many parents ask their kids for forgiveness, but um, I've had both my parents <laughs> apologize and ask for forgiveness on multiple occasions throughout my childhood um, and be like, hey, dude, like I'm human, too. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have reacted like that or I shouldn't have said that or I, I was out of line here. Um, and then reflecting, you know, where we can both say, like, I, I didn't mean that or like I shouldn't have I shouldn't have done that. Um, and it it fosters a better I mean, that's what relationship is and having mutual respect and saying like, you're a person, even though you're my kid and I'm your parent, you're a person just as much as I am. And we both have thoughts and feelings and opinions. And so when you step into that, you can share those things. Um, and then you, you know, as you grow up, like we're going together, you, I, I've never been 22 before this. And, and you've never been a dad of a 22 year old. You've never been a grandparent before this. So like, we get to like learn and grow together I think that understanding too is like, we're doing this together. We're learning together. Um, that helps too. <laughs> and on the big scale of things, the weird thing is, is in heaven's perspective, the four of us are all pretty close to the same age, right? I mean, a thousand years is, is a day. I mean, you know, what are you 22 or you're 52? It's like really in a, in a scope of a thousand years, right? So, and on, on that note, as we come up to the top of the hour, you know, we want to continue this conversation and stepping into what does it look like? We refer to this God as father. So there is some sort of parental understanding that we have in Christianity that we're relating to this Godhead as a parent as. So what does it mean? Like Phil was saying, what is it when you grow up? And if you don't have a father, if you don't have one half of that parental makeup what does that mean for faith then and things and so as we continue to walk into this together we're doing this together because my story is only made more profound through your story jim and through your story phil and through your story kayla right and vice versa and so this is where we need and this is um what we want to continue to do to to shake our boxes you know it's so interesting that as COVID's hit more and more of us spent more time on zoom just to emulate how boxed in we have lived our faith in the past. And so the idea is, is as we start to transition, you know, Christians transitioning into the world back where COVID is going to be, where we start to manage it, you know, not fight one another because of COVID, but live with one another so as to fight COVID, then we're going to start to hopefully see our boxes 
breakdown, you know, and we start to see that. And so we want you to continue to join us on this dialogue. We appreciate you joining us today. Uh, and so for those of you that have not done so, if you go right down below the these four squares on the YouTube thing, and it says uh, subscribe right there, just hit subscribe. And then right there with that little bell, if you tick that, then next Friday, when we go live again on uh, YouTube, you will then be notified and you can join the dialogue because if you see right there to the right, there's a chat and a live chat, which you can have for the conversations and stuff. And who knows if we have an ongoing dialogue, maybe sometime you'll be invited to join us uh, for this uh, on screen dialogue. You know, we can have then maybe a panel or something because we're about the dialogue because as we continue to step into each one, there's one another stories, guess what? It helps to expand our understanding of his story so that we can then find our places and fulfill our, our roles here on God's uh, stage uh, in the continual playing out of salvation. And so on behalf of Phil and Jim and Kayla, I'm Matt. This has been another episode of New Wine and Corked. Until next Friday, we'll see you on the flip side. Have a good one.